<laughs> Dude, never did it. Welcome back to Never Did It. I'm Brad Garoon, and I'm here with Jake Ziegler. On Never Did It, we look back at the last 100 years in movie history, although now 102 years in movie history, <laughs> in an effort to fill in some of our own movie blind spots. Today, we're covering the year 2023, but this isn't our 2023 episode because we already did that. This is our 2023 episode in terms of the Oscars. We're going to be talking about the 98th Oscars, is that right? 96th this year. Thank you. We'll be talking about the 96th Oscars. We're going to rank the Best Picture nominees, and we're going to talk about some movies that didn't get nominated for Oscars that we think deserve a little bit more love this year. Jake, where do we want to start? Do we want to do... Well, let's talk about Best Picture. I mean, that's uh, kind of the biggest category and can talk about some of our favorite movies. Do we want to go over our top tens for the year? Yeah, well, well, let's go over how we rank the Best Picture nominees. Yeah. We've both seen all of them now. Mm -hmm. You posted this question on Facebook, I think, on our Facebook page. And I replied, do you want to go first or should I go first? So I'll let you go first today. Okay, cool. So just a caveat to start, I thought all of the movies nominated for Best Picture this year were at least good, uh, ranging from good to oh my God. And <laughs> there's two oh my gods and a couple of close ones even. So my number 10 is Barbie, uh, which I liked and probably suffered. I've only seen it once and I saw it right after I saw Oppenheimer. I did Barbenheimer. So I think it may have suffered from that a bit. But I also think that Barbie, more so than any of these other movies, is pulled in too many different directions because of the nature of the of what it's based on. Yeah, on the one hand, it's trying to be, and in a lot of cases, really successfully is, a, a definition of what modern feminism is, or even just the modern experience of being a woman. But it's also full, filled with product placement and some a lot, quite a bit of humor that doesn't work. Will Ferrell being Will Ferrell, which is inherently funny, but... Unfortunately, it's in a movie, which means someone else wrote it for him. So it's it's not that funny. And I'm a man. So the America Ferrera stuff didn't work for me. And also, I think her character, it's weird that she's nominated for Best Supporting Actress. I think her <laughs> character kind of doesn't mm-hmm. really make sense in the movie. Like if I were to choose between her and Margot Robbie, I, I think the Margot Robbie should have been nominated. Conversation is kind of dumb. But if I had to choose between the two of them, I would definitely have chosen Margot Robbie. Didn't get that choice. But I had a really fun time watching it. I think it's, uh, it's uh, not in my top 20 of 2023, but it's but it's not far off. I remember when it fell out. My number nine is Killers of the Flower Moon, which I think is great. It's just, I hate to be this guy. It's long and I fell asleep in the theater and I missed <laughs> and I missed kind of a pivotal moment. I missed the uh, elders in the afterlife moment. And when I found out that that's what I slept through afterwards, I was pretty upset. Yeah, that's crucial. Yeah, but I think it's it's very, very good. And I will, it's one that I, I will watch again one day for sure. Um, at eight, I have past lives, which... Again, I liked a lot. It's not too long. It's very short. I have no complaints about past lives. It's From here on out, it's just I liked the movie that came next more. Um, mm-hmm. That's really it. I thought past lives were very good. Maestro also I thought was excellent. In the first 20 minutes of Maestro, I turned to my wife and said, Bradley Cooper is directing the f*** out of this thing. Yes. And if this can keep up this pace, this will be the best movie of the year. It couldn't. It changed into something different. What it changed into, I liked a lot. I just didn't like it as much. Mm-hmm. Number six is Zone of Interest, which I'm still sort of trying to figure out. I I was enthralled by it. The sound design on this movie is out of control. Unreal. It's very disturbing. I did not have an emotional reaction to it, and I had a feeling that was going to happen, and I think there's many reasons for that. One being the amount of Holocaust film and television and museums I've seen, and the other being it's the point of it is to show you what it's like when you remove emotion from something so terrible, and I thought that was really interesting. Uh, Number five is American Fiction, which uh, I think Cord Jefferson is a wonderful heir to the Woody Allen throne. Um, (laughs) I thought he made a great, in my opinion, he made a great Woody Allen movie here, better than Mm -hmm. more than three quarters of the Woody Allen movies. And I thought every person in it to a person was excellent. I laughed so much watching this. Oh, Um, we did too. Yeah. And it's great to see uh, uh, something that leans more towards comedy uh, getting nominated for Best Picture. Mm hmm. Uh, and speaking of which, Holdovers is my number four, and I feel pretty much the same about all that. doesn't feel like a Woody Allen movie. feels much more like a Hal Ashby movie, but I thought it was great. And I wouldn't be hurt if your doppelganger Paul Giamatti won Best Actor for it, even though I don't think that's going to happen. Might. He might. He's got a better chance of upsetting than most other people now. Yep, that's true. Uh, number three is Anatomy of a Fall. Just like a gripping courtroom drama, almost as good as the courtroom drama Planet of the Apes. Ugh. Stop. Now you're just trying to hurt me. (laughs) It's incredible. Really, not like tense in the way that like you're always worried about what's going to happen, but 
just wonderfully shot. There's a scene in it where the son is giving testimony and the son is blind. So it focuses on his face, the whole scene, and the camera moves back and forth so that he's facing the person talking to him, but we don't see the person talking to him. And I imagine that's because he doesn't see the person talking to him. When that scene happened, I was like, this movie is in a different class. Number two is Poor Things. It's probably the best time I had at the movies this year. It's the <laughs> funniest movie I've seen in a long... Actually, there's a, there's a bunch of funny movies this year. Like Bottoms was also, I thought, really hilarious. Theater Camp, Poor Things, I just did not expect to be this funny and uh, looks so interesting. Uh, mm-hmm. I know you have a problem with Wes Anderson being too Wes Anderson a lot of the time. Mm-hmm. Yep. This to me was like a nice, I don't, I don't feel that way, but this to me was a nice compromise between like Wes Anderson and Terry Gilliam and much like Barbie. One of the things I liked most about Barbie was how it looked. Oh, the look is phenomenal. Uh, and poor things. Same thing. I love this. Just like the sets are, are terrific. And then number one is Oppenheimer. We, we, t- we already talked about Oppenheimer for like 40 minutes on this podcast. I'm not going <laughs> to say more about it. It's just the best movie of the year. What's yeah. Spoiler alert. Agree on that. But uh, yeah, I definitely agree. This is one of the strongest lineups of best picture nominees we've seen probably since they increased the, the number. It was 10 for a couple of years and then it went to between five and 10, but it was always like eight or nine. And then they just increased it to that so that it's always going to be 10. So I think this is one of the strongest lineups we've seen, I think, probably since that change happened. I think all the movies are excellent. Nine of them are in my personal top 10 of the year, which is, yeah, is insane. Um, And then the 10th one is uh, my number 12 of the year. So of the Best Picture nominees, they're all in my top 12 movies of the year. So that's quite a bit. That's crazy. There's only two in my top 10 of the year. Oh, really? Although Anatomy of a Fall is not far out. But yeah, only Oppenheimer. And they're my number one in two movies of the year. But Mm. Uh, yeah, only Oppenheimer and Poor Things. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. My number, uh, if I'm ranking the best pictures, um, the 10th one is Maestro, uh, which I, again, I think is really good. Bradley Cooper's great in it. I was a little bit surprised at how much of the movie belongs to Carrie Mulligan, yeah. uh, especially in the second half. It's really, really her movie. Uh, and they're both just phenomenal in it. Definitely deserved their nominations. Yeah. Number nine is for me is Barbie. Uh, yeah, I, I I think it's really, really funny. It looks amazing. I uh, love Ryan Gosling in it. Um, you know, I think Margot Robbie is really good in it. I mean, she was the obviously you know the perfect choice for that. I just think it's a really, you know, really fun uh, movie. Lived up to you know the hype. I thought of what they had promised it was going to be. And the next one for me is American Fiction, which again I laughed, laughed so much at. I thought it was just really, really funny. Love Jeffrey Wright, love Sterling K. Brown. Glad that both of them got nominated. Number seven for me is another movie I just, I loved. The Holdovers uh, starring me and (laughs) Dominic Sessa and Divine Joy Randolph, Alexander Payne. And we did a whole episode on how much we love Alexander Payne movies. So not much more to say about that. But yeah, really love The Holdovers. Uh, Then for me, number six would be Killers of the Flower Moon, which surprisingly, you know, at at three hours and 40 minutes, I did not fall asleep for. I stayed up for the whole thing and just, you know, really loved it. I think the performances are outstanding. Just think it's really, really great. Number five for me is a movie I'm going to try to go see again if I have a chance, just because I thought it was such a unique kind of experience in the theater is the zone of interest. Uh, The sound design is, again, unlike anything I'd ever seen before. Uh, And even just the just the conceit of the movie, you know, there's a million Holocaust movies and a million World War Two movies. But I just I haven't seen anyone, any of them quite like this or even, you know, attempting anything quite like this. What's so interesting about the zone of interest? It reminded me a lot in pacing of a Kelly Reichardt movie. Of course, her movies aren't as dour as this. Well, eh, first cow kind of is. Kind of, but not, I mean, not quite. Well, you're right. The scale of the Holocaust is kind <laughs> yeah. of hard to match. But <laughs> yeah. um, but the pacing, I was like, oh, it kind of felt like we went and saw Showing Up at the beginning of the year. And I mm-hmm. kind of felt the same, like stirring in my seat because that's what the director wants me to feel with how slowly everything's moving. And, and even just starting the movie with with like nothing on screen for a couple of minutes. and just... Very odd. Very disorienting. Yeah. Yeah. Very unique taken by that. Uh, number four was another movie. I started this movie at, I think, 11 or 1130 at night, Anatomy of a Fall. And it was, you know, two and a half hour movie. And I was just glued to the screen the whole time. I mean, the, the courtroom stuff is just phenomenal. Sandra Hewler, who is also in Zone of Interest, and she is great in both of these movies. Yeah, Anatomy of a Fall is one of the best, like, courtroom dramas I've seen. Love how they ended it. I just think it's nearly a perfect movie. Number three is Poor Things, which again, I laughed so much at. Mark Ruffalo just going for it 100%, uh, just not afraid. Just look as silly and goofy and and terrible as possible. (laughs) I just loved him in it. Uh, Emma Stone is just awesome. It's the best. And I think she's really good. 
but I think it's the best thing that she's ever done. And it's my favorite Yorgos movie uh, for sure. Really, really loved it. My number two is Past Lives. I'm just really moved by this. The two central performances I thought were just wonderful. It stuck with me for a long time. After I watched this, it, it was just so simple and just so beautiful. I loved how it looked. I loved the score. It just, uh, it really hit something in me. And then number one, you know, hate to be the boring guy about it, but it's, it's Oppenheimer. We did this two weeks ago, too, where we everyone picked Apocalypse Now as their 1979 movie, I think. Right. This, is, this is the Apocalypse Now of 2023. It's Oppenheimer. Right. Exactly. Okay. It's hard to disagree when we both like, yeah, we love all these movies. These were great. Right. <laughs> yep. Um, it's Okay. So you said that nine of them are in your top 10. Let's yes. let's pivot here real quick. What's the one movie in your top 10? Oh, I in my top 10. It's not yeah. best picture is uh, I have as my number seven movie of the year is uh, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. I had a feeling you were going to say that. Um, yeah. We, when you were talking about Maestro, it had me thinking about Carrie Mulligan's performance in Maestro. So let's, let's go first to um, best lead actress. Mm-hmm spoilers for maestro and for real life <laughs> the scene where carrie mulligan's character dies is one of the more heart-wrenching immersive scenes in a film i've seen in a really long time you're laying there with her as she struggles to breathe and you want and i i don't know about you i wondered the entire time are we going to see her stop breathing here she's very ill yep and then it pans from us watching her to seeing what she's seeing and you stop hearing her breathe. And that's for me a top five scene in movies this year. I thought it was unbelievable. And Agreed. she did a wonderful, wonderful job. The the accent's a little arch. You know, all the accents in this movie are kind of going for it. Mm -hmm. And I still didn't find it distracting. I thought the scene where she met um, Leonard Bernstein for the first time was was wonderful. I I, I kept laughing, and maybe it's because it was like a little bit about them being Jewish but not feeling Jewish, or the other way around. Uh, well, not the other way around; they were Jewish. You know, she's not going to win, but I think she did a, a a great great job. And I think some people are dogging on her really unfairly and dogging on the movie a little bit. I don't know. I I think time is going to be really kind to this movie. I think so too. I agree. Emma Stone is unbelievable in four things. She yeah. this, this is one of the most bold, really vulnerable portrayals you can have in a movie. She is a woman at the top of her game. She doesn't have to be naked in a third of a movie, and yet she is here. And she's so funny. <laughs> it's a weird movie to think of as as really funny, just when you try to describe it. But it is. I mean, it's just it's hilarious. And she's so great in it. And I don't think. Anyone will be surprised if she wins. She's one of the two favorites, just like she was in the movie The Favorite. <laughs> I'd be super stoked if she won. I'd also be stoked if Lily Gladstone won because she was yes. excellent. Yes, she is very, very good. She's kind of the favorite. Uh, she's the favorite in our house, but it would it would be hard to argue either way because yeah, they're both so good and so different. I mean, you know, for Emma Stone, it's a really you know like a hilarious, bombastic, uh, you know, out there, wild performance. And Lily Gladstone, it's it's so much the opposite. You know, it's a lot of subdued facial reaction. You know, just different, quiet moment type of performance and, and they're, they're both really really good i wonder if if emma stone wins if some of that is going to be from folks who felt that gladstone wasn't in enough of the movie or didn't carry enough of killers of the flower mm -hmm. which would be hard to do in a nearly four hour long movie i mean right. people i've seen people say you know she's supporting but it's like i don't know is dicaprio in that much more of the movie than her i, I don't know i i think it's probably pretty close well, and I always try to remember, too, for me, when I'm thinking about it, um, you know, not get too technical here, but I always think of like the wording of the actual category. It's, you know, best actress in a leading role. It's not best actress with the most screen time, you know, and it's like, is Lily Gladstone, is that a leading role? Like, yes, that is the leading role of the movie. You know what I mean? Like she, the plot revolves around her. Yeah. So like, regardless of like, you know, if DiCaprio has more screen time or whatever, and I think they're both leading roles. I mean, I think those are the, you can say that they're both leading roles. You can have more than one, yep. but I mean, she's definitely a lead role and I'm glad they nominated her there correctly. It's interesting you say that too, because by that line of thinking, you could say that DiCaprio and De Niro both had leading roles. Although I think it's fair to put De Niro in the supporting category. I don't know. A lot of it's political too. Definitely. Um, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, she's wonderful. Then also we have Sandra Huller. I'm glad she's in there for Anatomy of a Fall and not for The Zone of Interest, because how do you even yeah. evaluate a, 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 an acting role in The Zone of Interest? In fact, the only person in the zone of interest that I would even think about evaluating is sort of the mother and the mother, her mother. The only person whose character changes at all in the film is <laughs> right. what a great role. Uh, anyway, Sandra Huller, incredible. And yeah, you mentioned the ending to to Anatomy of a Fall before, and her performance in the movie helps that ending work. Absolutely. And you know what? I'm uh, it, it, we're not talking about him, but the little boy. You mentioned this in your review of Anatomy of a Fall and Letterboxd. Mm -hmm. But the young man who played her son, his name is uh, uh, Milo Machado Graner. 
I'm pronouncing that wrong for sure. <laughs> also incredible, as was Antonio Reinhardt, who played the opposing counsel. I hate that guy. Yeah, you hate him. You just hate him. <laughs> but honestly, he's just doing his job. Doing it well, yeah. And Swan Arlo, Arlod, Arlod, Swan Arlod, the guy who played her attorney and friend, also mm -hmm. very good. And in his one small scene, Samuel Thies, who played the, the deceased husband. Uh, oh, right. So what a great scene. Mm -hmm. uh, th so that's what, is that four or five? Uh, that's four. The fifth one is uh, Annette Benning in Nyack, which I believe you have not seen. No, I've seen it and I don't think it's good. I thought she was great in it, though. I, I actually, I like the movie and I thought she was really, really good in it. She's fine. I think the movie is like pretty mid. Jodie Foster is very entertaining in it. I liked her a lot. And I'm glad she got nominated. And Annette Benning wouldn't make my five. We'll talk a little more about that when we when we hit our, our underrated or overlooked movies. We'll talk yeah. about that. But she wouldn't make my five. But I don't have like an issue with her being in there because I thought she was very good. Mm, fair enough. I mean, she's playing mm -hmm. a difficult person in general. So mm -hmm. yeah, but like I would have loved for like Ao Edebiri to get in this for Bottoms. That would have been great. Or like Greta Lee for past lives. I thought Greta Lee, right? That, that what, something that actually might have happened. Greta Lee, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Or uh, Juliette Binoche for the Taste of Things. Right. Would, yeah, would have been fun. To see. We didn't get many. Like I love so many of the movies that came out here, and I think a lot of the nominees are just are just great. But I missed the years when there was like something like just completely out of left field. You know, like all the nominees this year were like pretty uh, more or less expected. You know, like nothing right. was like an enormous surprise. I know you didn't like Asteroid City, but like I loved Scarlett Johansson in Asteroid City. I don't think that that's the kind of movie where she's going to win for. But mm -hmm. honestly, and if Margot Robbie was going to get nominated, we're not there yet, but if Margot Robbie was going to get nominated for something, I thought she was much better in Asteroid City or her role was more mm -hmm. important to them. Well, I can't say that. Yeah, okay. that, that's not true at all. <laughs> no, it's not true. But her role was very important to Asteroid City, to the emotional mm -hmm. crux of the third act. Right. And there was less competition in that category because mm -hmm. America Ferreira is nominated for Best Supporting Actor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. Let's let's move over to Best Actor. So you're in this category. I am in this category. So are you? And so am I. Yes. So, Brad, Brad, so the joke here. I don't know. I don't know if we've ever said this on the podcast before. Yeah. I don't but know. At various times in our lives, people have thought that I look like Bradley Cooper, and people have thought that Jake looks like Paul Giamatti. This has stopped being the case for me as I've gotten older. It's probably going to be the case more for you as you get older. Yep. <laughs> um, there's that. They were both very good. Giamatti actually might win. Bradley Cooper will not because people are mean to him. <laughs> which I, I do not understand yeah but i don't get that either i don't understand what the what the backlash is I, honestly, I hate to be this guy but i think it's jealousy like this yeah. is a dude who loves what he does wants to be the best at it and people don't like that and 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 when he chooses to do something he does become like the best at it i mean what he, he learned how to talk like uh you know have the same like vocal pattern as sam elliott just on the hope that he could cast sam elliott in a star is born that's awesome that's awesome. Yeah. And and even when he was talking about just making Stars Born, he he talked to uh Pearl Jam lead singer Eddie Vedder and Eddie Vedder said, Man, you shouldn't make this movie. It's gonna, you know, it's it's gonna be hard or whatever looking for it. And he was like, No, man, I'm gonna do it. And then he did it and Eddie's like, Yeah, it was wrong. I love that Eddie Vedder and Bradley Cooper are friends. I do too. I just think that's just fantastic. That makes me really happy. So the favorite in this category is Killian Murphy. With good reason, Oppenheimer is a sensation. He's excellent in it. There's not a scene where he's not good. In Oppenheimer, and he's on screen almost the entire film. Yeah, and he's as one of those actors who's been respected for a long time in a lot of different kind of movies. And you know, everybody seems to like him. You know, they all have great things to say about him. And yeah, he really carries an enormous weight. It's either him, but you know, Giamatti's right up there too. He's won a lot of the uh, of the of the precursor type awards. So it's uh, it feels like a pretty close race between the two of them. Yeah. Also, Killian Murphy just apparently secured the rights for 28 years later, the end of yep. the 28 zombie trilogy, which is yep. like, I'm so excited for that. Yeah, me too. We mentioned, we mentioned last week, I don't like horror movies, but 28 Days Later is one of my favorite movies. Yeah, that one's really good. That's one of the better ones for sure. Um, 28 Weeks is one of the few horror movies I saw in the theater and was a little disappointed in it, but not terribly. It's fine. It's not terrible. It's just like the first, you know, 28 Days is like excellent. You know, so it's yeah. a lot to live up to. And then you've also got, you mentioned it before, but we've got Jeffrey Wright in American fiction. He was incredible as a neurotic, uh, frustrated writer and professor. So he's basically doing a Michael Douglas role and he's fantastic. He's so, he's so funny. He's another guy who has been well-respected for a long time, yep. has been excellent every time out and not really awarded for it. I just not too long ago watched Basquiat, one of his you know earlier roles. Oh yeah, And he's great. I think that movie's a little boring, but he's wonderful in it. 
Yeah, I haven't seen that, but I know it's. It, I mean, I know that was like one of his first big things. Yeah, and it's nice to see him. No, someone again nominated for a comedy, which yeah. is uh, like we were talking about with horror earlier. Is not always the most recognized uh, genre. Yeah, for sure. Who's the fifth guy? Fifth guy is uh, Coleman Domingo. Uh, starred in Rustin, which was a, a Netflix movie that kind of came and went. But you know, Coleman Domingo again, another actor people are you know really like. He's very good in Rustin. You know, it's a kind of uh, it's a typical ish biopic type movie. But you know, Rustin was a, an important civil rights figure. Uh, Coleman Domingo was very good in it, and he was also uh, very good in a supporting role in The Color Purple. So there might have been some uh, you know residual voting for that too. Like, oh gosh, he was really good in two movies, sort of thing. So there might have been some right. vote, votes for him for that. Um, he took DiCaprio's spot basically DiCaprio had been predicted for a long time but uh, he missed out and uh, Coleman Domingo got that fifth spot instead it's interesting you said you know it came and went but it's it's still there where it came to right. Netflix because mm. I was about to say it's a movie no one saw but the fact that it was on Netflix means people probably a lot of people saw it mm-hmm. um, I didn't see it uh, because I heard it wasn't great I heard he was great but that it wasn't great mm-hmm. the best Coleman Domingo performance of the year for me because I didn't see the color purple or Rustin was he was on uh, one of those late night shows or maybe one of those British talk shows and told the story of how he met his husband. And it's one of the sweetest stories you'll ever hear. Oh, that is nice. I haven't seen that. Look that up. It's really good. Mm. Let's get out of the actors categories for a bit and talk about uh, director, best director. All right. Yeah. Some controversy here too. Well, some internet controversy. Internet controversy because mm-hmm. Greta Gerwig didn't get nominated because all the movies that got nominated were better than Barbie. Actually, I want to get your opinion on this. Mm hmm. You're not the Greta Gerwig thing. You and I have talked about it privately a lot. We both think it's like, yeah, it would have been fine if she was nominated, but it's also look at the slate of people who got nominated. Yeah, it's really. But but what I do want to ask you that I don't know your opinion on, you sent me um, the other day news about this new Oscar category that's coming out. Best mm-hmm. casting. You said to me, I mean, you were speaking my language. You said, you know, it's not stunt, stunt choreography and it's not voice work. Mm-hmm. Two things that we both think need to be Oscar categories that aren't, mm-hmm. but at least the, you know, at least it's expanding. But mm-hmm. then I was listening to the um, the Big Picture podcast today and Sean Fennessy had an interesting take, which was, yes, it's good that they're expanding Oscars, but if this is a thing where like best, and I bring this up now because best director often reflects best picture. Mm-hmm. Very closely. And if this is just another category that reflects the same movies in that batch of 10 that are in Best Picture, then what's the point? And the reason it exists is because a lot of people who are in casting are in leadership positions at the Academy. And that's Mm -hmm. why he was also upset about how there's no stunt choreography Oscar. And because there's no, because stunt coordinators don't get leadership positions in the Academy. So it, you know, obviously it's a wait and see what happens kind of thing. Of course. Yeah. But how are you feeling about it? Um, you know, I hate to, to not really answer, but it is kind of a wait and see thing because of the way it kind of sounds to me is it might almost be like, it almost sounds like it's going to be like an ensemble award in, in a way, like, you know, best casting is going to have to go to something that has like a bigger cast. You would think, you know, kind of by its nature, just because that's the way things kind of go in, in the Academy, you know, like with best casting, are they going to give it to something like past lives that essentially has like three characters in it? Would it go to something more like you know, Oppenheimer or Barbie that has like, you know, 10, 12, 15 characters in it, you know, like more actors and more recognizable faces. So it's just kind of kind of interesting. But that was kind of my first thought on it was that it seems like it's it's maybe a way to kind of give out an ensemble type type of award to, you know, maybe a way to recognize like, hey, you know, this movie's not going to win any individual acting awards, but, you you know, everyone in it was really good. So, you know, we can maybe recognize it for the casting. Interesting, because casting and cast mean two different things. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if it's if it's an award to give to a casting director or is it an award to give to a cast? Well, the, I believe the casting director would win it. Right. But at the Screen Actors Guild Awards, do they give the best cast in a motion picture award to the casting director? They give it to the cast. Yeah. So I think this is a casting award, which means, I mean, we'll see. I Because I, I don't know if it's going to be a best ensemble thing. Well, it's definitely not like called that or anything, but I feel like that it's uh, like a similar vibe. Meanwhile, the Screen Actors Guild does give awards for stunt ensembles in a motion mm-hmm. picture. Get it together, Oscars. Seriously. All right, best director. We've got our favorite, and by our favorite, I mean the world's favorite, the win, Christopher Nolan. Mm-hmm. Uh, finally, in his 10th film, getting the award. So that would be kind of uh, poetic for him. And and his best movie, which yes. is nice. We've got, how do you pronounce her name, uh, Anatomy of a Fall? Justine, I think it's Tri- Triet. Triette, she, I hate to say this, but just based on Oscar history, you could say she took Greta Gerwig's spot. 
the one mm. spot for a lady. Would have been nice to have two ladies nominated. A lot of qualified candidates that were, you know, that were female this year that they, you know, did besides, I mean, not only Greta Gerwig, but there were several others as well. Yeah, yep. Celine Song. I mentioned Bottoms before. It wasn't on anyone's radar for this stuff, but Emma Seligman, I think, did a really nice job directing Bottoms. It's a very funny movie. Yeah, it's really funny. That I liked a lot. Yeah. All right. Who else we got in this category? Uh, Scorsese, of course, Oscar royalty, Killers of the Flower Moon. This is his, I believe, his ninth, uh, his ninth best director nomination. He's now the most nominated living director. Who's the most nominated dead director? Uh, Billy Wilder. Or no, William William Wyler. That's not the same. No, not the same at all. But sometimes I confuse them. Yeah, it's William Wyler. I wish it was Billy Wilder. Yeah, I think Wilder is like second, though. I think he's got 10. Very nice. Now, uh, now I got to look it up and make sure. But yeah, I'm pretty sure Wyler has 12 and Billy Wilder has 10. Uh, and who else is nominated for this award? Uh, then it's Yorgos Lanthimos for Poor Things and then uh, Jonathan Glazer for The Zone of Interest. And is this the first nomination for each of them? Uh, not for Yorgos. Yorgos was nominated for The Favorite as well, nice. but for Jonathan Glazer, definitely. So I saw, I think I saw you say or hear you say that you, that oh, you said it earlier this in this thing that this is Glazer's best movie, Zone of Interest? Yes, I think Sexy Beast is amazing. I remember really liking it. I just I haven't seen it in a long time. Um, but yeah, I just I, I it would be hard for me to it's, it's actually hard for me to say that because I haven't I haven't seen any of them in birth. I only saw once when it came out. And you um, like it. I remember not liking it. And actually, I'm wrong about director too. William Wyler is the most nominated director total with 12 or says he this is actually his 10th. Hmm. And then Spielberg has nine and Billy Wilder has eight. There we go. All right. So lots of living guys. Yeah, those are the top four. And then there's one, two, three guys who have seven or tied for fifth place. Cool. Which other Oscar categories are you interested in? Well, animated feature uh, has a couple of interesting things in it. Talk about it. Yeah, of course, there's uh, the two the two heavy hitters in the animated feature category. There's the Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, uh, which is a sequel to the Oscar winning Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, uh, which was also you know very well received. Uh, very well liked. It's a very, very cool movie, but it's going up against uh, Hayao Miyazaki's The Boy and the Heron, which is, again, supposedly his last movie, uh, which also is really good, really well received, uh, and is probably, I'd say, the front runner to win uh, in that category. And then the other nominees, Elemental, which is kind of, I liked it, but it was kind of whatever. Robot Dreams was a bit of a surprise. I don't know a whole lot about that one. It's not really playing in that many theaters. What's it's that? not playing in the United States right now. Really? Still? It's not. Yeah. Ridiculous. But I do want to give a big shout out to Nimona. It's got nominated in this category. It doesn't have a shot to win, but I loved this movie. Uh, my wife and uh, my daughter love this movie too. It's number 15 on my top 20. I just, I really love this movie. I was really happy to see it get nominated. Uh, my good friend, Mike Tanzillo is in the credits of this film. It is when we paused it to make sure that his name was in there and we saw it and we, we smiled and we were happy. Yeah. So he was on the Blue Sky team when where this movie originated. Yeah, I love Nimona. I thought it was great. Of this slate, Nimona is, would be my second co- favorite. I think Spider-Man deserves to win. I agree that Boy in the Heron is going to win. I think Elemental is pretty poor, actually. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, was, I had a very rough experience watching the movie in the theater. I was in a bad mood, and then I lost <laughs> one of my earbuds. Oh, uh, crap. Seat. And like you, because I live in the United States, I haven't seen Robot Dreams. I can't even find a bootleg version of it anywhere. Not that I would ever do that. Of course not. And I'm dying to see it because I'm very surprised that it beat out Suzume, which actually was getting some. It got nominated for an Annie Award. Mm-hmm. So I thought and people like that director, even though I think he's kind of I find his stuff kind of cloying. And I don't know. It's like a it's like a soap opera. His stuff. And I saw Suzume. And it was. Yeah, that's that's legit. Yeah, the, I saw his other movie, Your Name. Uh, which I which really is, liked that one, actually. I think it's just all right. It's a, mm-hmm. another one. It's like, the look, these are not movies made for middle-aged men. They're made for young girls, <laughs> and they feel it. They, they really do. Yeah. <laughs> they're beautiful movies. He's an amazing visual mm-hmm. storyteller. Um, but I find the stories a little boring. Yeah, but so I was surprised. Uh, and then your prediction was that Chicken Run 2 would, would be nominated. I did think that, yeah, I wasn't uh, wasn't looking at Robot Dreams at all getting in there. I thought Chicken Run would would make it in, you know, because the first one came out before there was a, a category for best animated feature, um, so there was no way it could have been nominated. So, you know, I thought maybe that would carry over, you know, to some love for the new one. Plus, I thought the new one was fun, and it just seemed like, I mean, why would anyone pick Robot Dreams? I don't know, you know it just didn't uh, didn't occur to me. Fair enough. Um, I haven't. I have two animated films in my top ten. One of of twenty twenty three. One of them, I'll talk about it more later is sadly it wasn't eligible for an Oscar because it never played in theaters. But Mm -hmm. I just think there's a lot, there was a lot of good animated stuff this year, but this devotion to Pixar is very odd while Pixar is going through a slump. 
Yes. Okay. Anything else? Any other interesting categories? One other one that I do just, the, I think this is the last one uh, that I like, but uh, there's a couple of interesting things actually in the song category this year, which sometimes is kind of a waste of a category. But this year there's, of course, there's uh, the, the Diane Warren song every single year. That's the first <laughs> thing. When I'm predicting my nominees, that is literally the first thing I do. I go, Oop, which song is it Diane Warren does? And then I mark that one down and I move on because that's just going to happen. And, and it's from a movie called Flame and Hot about the creation of the Flame and Hot Cheeto. It's directed by Ava Longoria. It was on Hulu. I'm pretty sure it never played in theater. So I don't even know how it's eligible to be not. I think it did. I definitely saw it at the re I saw it available to see at the Regal. Oh, you did. Okay. I did, yeah. So I couldn't find like any box office information about it, like any, you know, money. I couldn't find anything. So that's getting harder and harder to find now because there are ways that they can get around having to report any of it. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I'm having a hard because I keep this list on Letterbox called small sci-fi where I like to. Yeah remind myself of like smaller science fiction films because I think everyone thinks like you have to have a lot of special effects. It's really not true to have mm. a good sci-fi movie. And I can't find budget information on a lot of the movies that I find. Interesting. Yeah, but it's so funny. And I think Flame and Hot now you can watch on Disney Plus even. Yeah, you can. Yep. And truthfully, the movie is totally okay. It's, you know, it, it's nice, but in, in, in the song is whatever, you know, but again, Diane Warren gets her spot. John Baptiste has a song in there for his documentary, American Symphony. Right. Song is called "It Never Went Away." Uh, I wrote it for his wife, who was going through cancer treatment. Uh, it was, you know, a big part of what the the documentary was about. Really beautiful song. The documentary is very good. Uh, I was surprised actually that it was not that was not nominated for documentary as well. Um, so yeah, it's very good. I like the song. And then the two songs from Barbie, of course, are very good. The Billie Eilish song is very good. That's probably going to win. It fits well with the movie, all that stuff. And of course, really looking forward to Ryan Gosling performing. I'm just Ken at the Oscars. That should be a lot of fun. He's not doing it. He's not. That's the rumor. They're like, Ryan Gosling doesn't want to do it. And if he won't do it, the song will not be performed at the Oscars. I mean, yeah, that's true. I don't want to see anybody else do it if he won't. But I don't, it's weird. They usually like to have all the songs performed. But I guess if he won't do it, then, yeah, I don't want to see anybody else do it. I think this whole thing with these other with Greta and um, Margot not getting nominated. He's like being a little, little, little annoying little boy. Interesting. Well, you know, back in 2008, there was a movie that was critically acclaimed and made a bajillion dollars and everybody loved it. It was called The Dark Knight and it also didn't get nominated for Best Picture or Director or Actor or Screenplay. And, you know, they still all showed up at the Oscars for their other awards. You know, there wasn't. And, and the reason and then what happened after that is they bumped Best Picture up to 10 nominees because The Dark Knight didn't get in. Right. The stuff, you know, it it, it happened. <laughs> you know, yeah. it happens. Barbie got a lot of recognition. You know, it's it, it has eight nominations in, you know, some of the big categories. And I just want to see him perform the song. I think it would be fun. <laughs> you know, like, come on, Ryan. Over. Ryan, if you're listening, just just please perform the song. I think it would be fun. Go on. What's the last movie? And the Here's last that. one is one uh, that my wife and I are very excited about because we thought there was no chance. Um, I'm, I'm sure I've mentioned this before, but my wife is Native American, and so when we looked at the short list of songs, you know, they they were uh, before the Oscars, they always release a list of 15 songs. They call it the short list of songs that are like eligible. You know, the the finalists, and there was a song from Killers of the Flower Moon. I I do not know how to pronounce the title, uh, but it's subtitled "A Song for My People." And we're like, oh, man, that would be really cool if they nominated it and did the performance. It'd be like you know, nothing they've ever done before. It's a true Native American song, you know, done by Osage, uh, you know, legit Osage singers. We're like, man, this is really cool. I'd love it if they did this, but they won't. But they did nominate it. And I hope they do have a performance of that because, yeah, it would be really cool to see on a, you know, such a big, uh, big platform. Awesome. All right. Well, that's that's how we feel about the Oscars. Also, Robert Downey Jr. is going to win. Also, uh, Divine Joy Randolph is going to win. That's the surest of sure thing. I mean, you can mark that one down today. Yep. Uh, let's talk about movies that don't get talked about in the Oscar conversation. Yes, agree. We can just do this like willy nilly. I mm -hmm. have several movies I want to talk about br briefly that deserve some love that don't get Oscar love. A lot of this is genre stuff. Some of this are like things that people were surprised didn't get nominated for Oscars. The first one is The Iron Claw. I think we both thought that this would, would get nominated at least for some stuff. Something, yeah. Not shocked that Zac Efron couldn't get in for best actor because it's pretty stacked. Although, the, I mean, Coleman Domingo could have come or gone. That's not a well-loved mm. movie. But no one saw Iron Claw, so that was part of the problem. It came out really, really late in the year. Mm. We're huge wrestling fans, so we were stoked for it. Although, I think for both of us, knowing the story was made us be like, well, that's not how that happened. Yeah, <laughs> that, that timeline is off. Right. No, that person yeah. doesn't exist for some yeah. reason. <laughs> but it is a wonderful movie, and Efron is incredible in it. Best by far, yeah. 
Yeah, and Jeremy Allen White's very good, and actually all the brothers were good. You know, um, Holt Mal- McElhenney was all right. I think he had he got to play it a little bit one dimensional. Mm-hmm. Lily James was good. Yep. Um, Moore Tierney was kind of doing a lot, mm-hmm. and I have to have to call out two performances specifically in the positive. One being MJF Maxwell Friedman, um, <laughs> not really being in the movie, which is kind of funny after. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> boasting about how much he had been uh, in it uh, in the lead up to it. Mm -hmm. Uh, Kevin Anton played Harley race. And I thought, wow, it's like they dug Harley race out of the ground and de-aged him. This is seriously on the other hand. uh, I don't want to say his name, but the guy who played Ric Flair, not great. Not amazing. Yeah. Not amazing. Not amazing. Um, But the movie was very good. I, I liked it a lot. It's my number 20 movie of the year. Blackberry is yep. you mentioned flaming hot there have been and there's barbie there's just like a an air there's a lot of movies that came out this year about products that we've used in the past and blackberry mm-hmm. i thought far and away was the best one yep i saw some people upset that glenn howerton was not nominated for best actor or best supporting actor mm-hmm. and I, I get it he was so good yeah. um kind of just doing his character from always sunny but in a more serious way Mm-hmm. yeah i mean i this is another one like if he had made it into the five i would have thought you know i would have been happy with that but i mean again looking at the five that are there they're really strong yeah so it's hard to say who i would have taken out but they're uh, not for, from for waterloo <laughs> and also shout out to sung Wan cho for getting in a motion uh feature motion picture and being very good in it if for mm-hmm. the two scenes he was in it right <laughs> um i really like theater camp uh i know I, have you even seen this yet yeah i've seen theater camp oh i thought you were skipping it because you hate ben platt uh, I, I wasn't I wasn't super into it, into the idea of it because of Ben Platt, but um, I am a voter for the uh, Independent Spirit Awards, and it mm. was uh, nominated for three Independent Spirit Awards, so I did watch it so I could vote on it, and I did like it. I didn't love it, but I did like it. Uh, as a, I've never been to theater camp, but as a summer camp guy, I mm-hmm. thought it was wonderful. Even not as a summer camp guy, I just thought it was very, very funny. Mm-hmm. Uh, my favorite documentary of the year was Albert Brooks Defending My Life, and um, we've talked enough about Albert Brooks two weeks ago and i mentioned this movie then but this is great it's just him and rob reiner having dinner and it's wonderful i've mentioned bottoms a lot on this po- episode people should really mm. see it it's really really funny mm. bo is afraid we talked about last week a little bit because ari aster we talked about hereditary and ari aster people didn't like this one and i really did i know you did too but yes i did yep. I, I think it's great this wasn't a product movie per se but it was a recent history movie dumb money yes this is an incredible movie. This is the kind of movie that people say they don't make anymore. Mm-hmm. They do make it. You just have to show up. You just have to know where. Yeah, you got to know where to look. I mean, it's not not hard. It's really annoying to me that people say this stuff mm-hmm. um, when they're not supporting, when they're not dumb money's not making $100 million. It's annoying to me that people say stuff like that. Absolutely. That's fair. One, one of the best times I had in the movies. J- John Wick 4. So good. Incredible film everything except for the green screen in the final duel and i understand that it would have probably been impossible to shoot that for real because how long do you have a sunrise for yeah <laughs> oh my god what a movie I, I i do hope they make more of these and not just whatever ballerina is going to be right agree the one movie that i thought should have been like if i were to take barbie out and put any other movie into the best picture uh, realistically it would have been godzilla minus one Mm, I still haven't seen it. And that really upsets me. It's so good. I'm now a little bummed. I didn't see Godzilla minus one minus color. And I'm just hoping that when they release the Blu-ray, it'll be part of it. Yeah, I hope so, too. Wow. What a movie. I mentioned this before, but the taste of things. I haven't seen all of the movies that are nominated for best international picture, but I can tell you, having seen a few of them, that this deserves to be there more than at least Teacher's Lounge, which is good, but not great. Mm hmm. This is one of the most beautiful movies you'll ever see. Or I haven't seen it yet, so yeah, I'm very excited for uh, whenever I'm able to. I think as as we're recording it, I think it it's releasing this weekend or next weekend. Yeah, um, we're actually it's coming to uh, Traverse City on Valentine's Day. I was uh, told this information by um, Jeff Richardson. You may have heard of him. God damn it! Um, but uh, <laughs> but uh, Traverse City is a little bit far away, so I'm not sure if I'll get a chance to go that far to see it. But yeah, it is. It's making its way around. I got to tell you, it would make for a great Valentine's Day date movie. I believe that's what he and his wife have planned. Yeah, it's uh, what a Jeff way to go. It's very romantic. And uh, Amelie is actually opening alongside of it, too. Uh, They are not similar. Yeah, I don't know. I just think it's interesting that Amelie's coming back, too. I like that movie. Someone's just like, here's some French stuff. Here's some more French stuff. Right? Yeah. (laughs) Why not? These are all in ascending order of how much I think you should see them. My next one's called Eyeballs in the Darkness. 
I don't know if you watched Eyeballs in the Darkness. I know you watched the, this is a sequel to the movie mm-hmm. Tooks and Fanny. No, I only watched the, that first one. I haven't seen yeah. any others since that and one. I know you don't like Tooks and Fanny, but. I thought um, it was okay. It just didn't move. It didn't do for me what it does for you. Right. I'm, I'm obsessed with it. I think, mm-hmm. okay, don't stream this on the streamer that is showing it. Uh, the director, Albert Bierney, is selling Blu-rays. And I think you should just buy the Blu-ray if you're interested. I should say what this is about. This is an animated film. It's an 8-bit animated film. So it looks like it was made on a Nintendo. And it's about two blobs, Tooks and Fanny, who go around their little world and talk about what it means to exist. And I, I think it's really beautiful. It's all in Russian, which is kind of weird, but there are subtitles. You can, you'll deal. Jake Delt. I, yeah. Asteroid City we talked about. I know you don't like this one. Uh, I, I think it's one of the top three Wes Anderson movies was charmed from start to finish. We got a lot of Wes Anderson stuff this year. Yeah. Real shorts. And I I liked all four of the shorts. Actually, I thought all four of them were good to varying degrees, but uh, yeah, just didn't uh, get into asteroid city at all. Uh, I did a lot. So I think people show, I'm very surprised. I'm glad that Anderson got at least one Oscar nomination this year, Mm -hmm. even if it was for, it wasn't the, my lead. I liked all the shorts a lot too. Uh, I liked Mm -hmm. the rat catcher one, the least. Henry Sugar probably second least, and the other mm-hmm. two I thought were incredible. Good for Wes. I'm surprised that Asteroids. I am surprised that Asteroid City just kind of fizzled out so yeah. so much. And then the movie I think people should watch most that got no love at all from the Academy is The Killer. Yeah, David Fincher still has it. Yep. Uh, yeah, he certainly hasn't lost it. Not at all. Uh, so yeah, check out all those movies. The Killer is just what a ride. Mm -hmm. What do you got for us? Yeah, I've got a couple more movies that I would recommend. Uh, This movie did get one Oscar nomination. It's in the original screenplay, but it kind of, you know, feels like it was really overlooked. It's called May, December. Todd Haynes movie with Natalie Portman and Julianne Moore, both of whom are just phenomenal. Charles Melton also has has a supporting role in it. He is very good. It's it's on Netflix, so it's really readily available. I I really, really liked the movie. I thought Natalie Portman was just amazing. Again, we're talking snubs for best actress. Natalie Portman would have made my five. Uh, for sure. I thought she was probably the best she's ever been. And another performance that I had rooted for for Best Actress, but I you know, just knew wasn't going to happen. Uh, an earlier release this year is a movie called You Hurt My Feelings. Before we get into You Hurt My Feelings, just real quick, if you're going to watch mm-hmm. May December, just know it's like it's pretty it's good, but it's pretty weird. It is. Yeah, it's a little odd. Yeah. Um, you Hurt My Feelings is not odd. It's like a super easy watch. It is. Yeah. It's um, yeah. I feel like Julia Louis-Dreyfus and anything else you you would like this. I mean, it's very much her movie. Yeah, totally. Uh, although, you know, uh, the guy Brutus Menzies, yes, Tobias Menzies, uh, Tobias Menzies. Yep. Also excellent in this movie. Just really, really good. Yeah. Yep. He is. It's really their dynamic is really good between the two of them. What else you got? Uh, again, another movie that has has a couple of nominations, but you know, didn't really catch on. It's another Netflix movie. Uh, it's called Society of the Snow. Uh, about the the Paraguayan soccer team that crashed in the Andes Mountains and uh, had to resort to some extreme, very extreme measures to stay alive. Uh, I thought it was just like saying maybe a little bit overlooked, not as widely seen uh, as maybe it should be. I think it's excellent. I haven't seen it yet. Oh, I think you'd really like it. Uh, uh, it's the same story as Alive, right? Yes. Yep. Definitely the same. Yeah, the exact same story, but I think it's based on the same book. Uh, another one got no love from the Academy, uh, but had some rumblings that maybe it would is uh, Andrew Scott and Paul Meskel in All of Us Strangers. I haven't seen that one yet either. It's coming very soon to Hulu. Uh, I think in like a week or uh, twenty February 22nd, maybe it'll be on Hulu. So um you should check it out. It's it's very good. Um, Andrew Scott is terrific in it. Paul Mescal is very good in it. I can see why it maybe didn't get you know the love from the Academy. It's a little bit esoteric. Uh, yeah, it, it falls into that same category. I don't even know what to call this category, but to me, it's the same as like After Sun and then also like Petite Maman, kind of like cozy drama, I would call it maybe. Like it has yeah. a cozy vibe, you know? Yeah, I'd see that. The Quiet Girl, those kinds of movies. Yeah, definitely. Yep, similar to that. That they have the same vibe for sure. We had also earlier in the year we had Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret. Great. Um, was just so so yeah, just so so good. Rachel McAdams was just wonderful in it. The girl who played Margaret, you know, was just was really good. One of the best coming of age movies we've had in quite a while. Uh, yeah, this was very good. I knew this kind of one well as you knew it wouldn't last to right. the Oscars. It wasn't big enough or flashy enough, but it was just just really really good. Uh, Kelly Freeman Craig was the director. She did a great job. It's yeah, just a really good movie. I have uh, no but, proof to this effect, but it may have been the movie that broke up the Safdie brothers. Oh, because they're no longer working together. That's right, they're not. Yeah. Uh, well, that's a bummer. What do we got? I got a couple more. One movie that got overlooked in the animated category that I would have liked to have seen get some recognition was uh, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Mutant Mayhem. I thought 100%. That 
100%. Yeah, it was really good. I loved that, you know, the, the turtles were all, you know, played by teenage boys. The voices, I thought they were all really good. Yeah, it's just a really, really cool movie. I only have one gripe with it, which is they gave all the Michelangelo characteristics to Donatello. Yeah, they did kind of, didn't they? Yeah, Michelangelo is just like kind of a awkward guy now. And Donatello was the funny one. I didn't like that. I mean, yeah. I did like it because it was very funny, mm. but just like switch it. Right. Yeah, I, that's a fair thing. There was also a movie early, another early in the year, another great best actress candidate who, you know, just wasn't going to make it to the end. Uh, Tayana Taylor in the movie called A Thousand and One came out early in the year. Uh, I was up for a couple of Spirit Awards. Was was very good. Is that an A24 movie? Yes. And you like it a lot? Do you think it's like it's really worth seeing or it's just like a sad one? I think it's really worth seeing. I think it's one okay. of the better uh, movies. I mean, it's a it's an honorable mention in my best of list. Okay, great. And then, yeah, I just want to list list off a couple more. I mean, these are more into like the the four star territory now of just movies that like I think are good. You know, I just want to kind of you know mention them just to give them give them a little bit of love. Air, I thought was very good. There's uh, an Anna Kendrick movie called Alice Darling that was good. Creed three, I really liked. I, I enjoy that series a lot. Uh, like Michael B. Jordan in that. Uh, another Netflix movie was out called Fair Play with Alden Ehrenreich that I really enjoyed. Uh, Fallen Leaves was the was a, an international film contender. Didn't end up getting nominated, but that was uh, very good. We mentioned Iron Claw. That was another one. There's a perform uh, Jim Gaffigan movie called Linoleum that I really liked. I wanted uh, to see that. Yeah, you would like it too. I think it's uh, you. I think you'd like it. Also, there's a movie that came out. It's on Mubi. Is where I watched it called Rotting in the Sun, uh, which is a really interesting kind of mystery movie. Um, there was a lot of talk about Saltburn. Uh, you know, a lot of talk about that movie with Barry, uh, Barry Keoghan and Jacob Elordi. I liked it. I didn't quite love it, but I, I definitely liked it. Horror movie came out earlier this year. Talk to me. I, I really enjoyed. And there was a movie called uh, another Netflix movie called They Clone Tyrone, which mm. I thought was was very cool. Liked that. And uh, the last one I want to mention is uh, actually on Tubi. You can watch it there. It's a really short movie. It's about 75 minutes. It's called Upon Entry. And it's uh, it shows a, a couple coming from Barcelona, Spain, trying to uh, they're trying to move into the United states and uh they you know get stopped at immigration you know in the airport and the whole movie takes place in uh you know as they're trying to just get into the country basically it's terrifying and suspenseful and uh, it's very good and it's on tubi all right i'm gonna do a few real quick honorable mentions too. blue giant an anime film that got like a lot of love from the animation community on letterboxd pretty good rye lane um Ooh, i like that one too yeah, it's about two young black kids in the UK, but also before sunrise vibes. Um, mm -hmm. Pretty cool in that way. Dream Scenario, the Nicolas Cage movie where he's in everyone's dreams. I haven't seen that yet, but we can rent it now. So we're going to watch that soon. It's interesting. Uh, I don't think it's great, but it's interesting. And he's very mm -hmm. good in it. As is, and I'm so in love with her, <laughs> uh, Dylan Galula. Oh, she's great. And Michael Sarah's in it. He's also very funny. And Tim Meadows. It, there's a lot of funny people in this movie. Uh, no Hard Feelings, the Jennifer yeah. Lawrence movie. That was good. Yeah, it was really good. Um, I kind of crapped on it before, but the teacher's lounge is good. And it's got a lot of good child actors in it. Mm -hmm. uh, worth checking out. I'm kind of surprised that this hasn't come up before, but it's sort of like a two hit of comic book fantasy style things um guns of the dragons on honor among thieves i should have mentioned that yeah we like we liked that too yeah really good and then uh you know marvel's kind of dead right now but guardians of the galaxy 3 was very good that was yeah a bright spot and it might be the last good marvel thing period so there's yeah. that <laughs> all right that's really closing the book on 2023 thanks again y'all uh for spending all this time with us i think this is we're getting close to our 50th overall episode i know we've done 42 i want to say official episodes and then this will be our fourth bonus episode so we're, we're getting real close to 50 we really appreciate that you all listen to it we have a lot of fun making it but it makes it all the more fun to know that people are enjoying it we'll be back next week with something a bit older sounds good to me if you want to know what is coming out next week, go to our Letterbox profile. You can find me at Brad Garoon on Letterbox. I think Jake, you're Jake Ziegler on Letterbox. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, Jake underscore Ziegler. And both of us have pinned to our profiles, our Never Did It podcast list. You could also just search for the Never Did It podcast list. And the two movies that will be discussed on next week's episode are always at the top of that list. We have a Facebook page now as well. You can check that out at uh, facebook.com slash Never Did It podcast. I'll be posting on that with uh, new episodes and uh, just fun updates from time to time about what we're watching and what's coming up. So check that out. And thank you for joining us for Never Did It.